Hello, inventors and entrepreneurs. My name is Courtney Laskowitz. I'm the managing director here at Inventors Groups of America, and welcome to Inventors Online. Thank you, everyone, so much for joining us today at our very last Inventors Online of 2021. Now, is anyone new here to Inventors Online? If so, go ahead and raise your hand, flash your hand in front of the screen. Welcome, welcome. All the newbies here, excellent, welcome. A look at everyone, we've got a couple newbies. Oh, your hands raised, awesome. All right, so with that said, uh, IGA was founded in 2017 by Stephen Key and Andrew Krauss. IGA's goal is to teach individuals how to best commercialize their product ideas, as well as strengthen and support inventor groups throughout the nation. We have a directory of local and regional inventors groups on our website whom we meet with every month. And if you are located near one, we highly encourage you to join. Of course, we'd love to hear your name and what state or country you are from. So go on over right now down to that chat box, open it up and please let us know your name and state or country you are located in. Of course, please do not disclose anything that is confidential and not already publicly available. Our meeting is also being recorded and will be harnessed on our website and YouTube channel soon after. Of course, feel free to change your name in the participants panel. Choose to be in gallery mode at any time so you can see everyone at the top right hand corner. And though it is not required, we would love to see you. So if you're willing to turn on your video, that would be fantastic. All right. So, uh, of course, please type in your questions early into the chat box if you have any. Uh, and before Andrew and I go toe to toe, uh, I would briefly like to mention a couple of things before we go ahead and get started here. Now, today's topic uh, can be a bit of a doozy. Um, combating barriers is no joke. Uh, and even worse, we often put them up uh, ourselves. Uh, there are so many reasons why people decide not to embark on the journey of uh, getting your product licensed, even though um, in their heart or your heart, uh, you want to, you find some possible excuse or barrier to not move forward from I need a patent uh, or I need a prototype. A majority of these barriers, or shall I say excuses, are often not true. Uh, in fact, it's often in our own mind or misconceptions or even myths that we personally are adhering to that are blocking us from moving forward. Now, get ready for a harsh reality that is actually quite beautiful. Uh, it may take a second to change your perspective, especially uh, when we have one for a very long time. That um, was an interesting play on words, Courtney, a harsh reality <laughs> that's actually quite beautiful. Yeah, I'm intrigued now. <laughs> yes, well, that's definitely uh, the case uh, because uh, the reality um, is it's often you as the inventor who is holding you back, uh, not the industry. And a lot of people believe, no, that's, that's not true. That can't be. It's not me. It's the industry. It's the product. It's the industry. And that's a, a harsh reality that is a beautiful thing because we can't change the industry. We can't change the way uh, inventors uh, or the way companies look at product ideas, but we can change our own perspectives. And that's the beautiful thing about it. Uh, so with that said, after this meeting, uh, I hope this fireside chat will help you move towards your goal of licensing. Uh, the first step is, of course, starting, uh, and that is what we're going to talk about today. Uh, one last thing that I will mention to you guys is your concerns are valid. They often make complete sense, whether it's a business advisor who told you something or you see it in the news so you feel like it makes sense for your product. Uh, our emotions and our misconceptions get in the way of our own professional movement. But uh, I want to tell you that the thoughts you have um, are valid, uh, and most of us go through a lot of these thoughts, including ourselves, and they're very real to us. Uh, I've definitely, uh, well, we'll get a little bit more into a lot of these misconceptions. That's the, the main reason why we're here. Uh, but a lot of people will say things like, Andrew, I don't have the time right now. Or Andrew, I have a family. I have a full-time job, personal responsibilities. I just, I just can't, I just can't work on this. It's just, I just can't. Uh, you want to, but you feel like you can't. And it makes sense. 
Um, but it's what inventors hide behind. Inventors make it happen. And I hope you guys will join us in making 2022 spectacular with accomplishing your inventing goals. Now, everyone, go ahead right now and type in your barriers into the chat and just know that you are not alone in your thinking. It is valid and we get it. They seem like very fair, understandable barriers. But today we're going to combat a couple of those. So, Andrew, are you ready for combat? Yeah, so <laughs> I am. I'm, I'm, I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to have a cage fight here. No, but um, when Courtney said she wanted to do this, she's like, do you want me to email you the questions I'm going to ask you? And I'm like, I don't know, I've been doing this for 21 years at Invent, right? I've been the co-founder. And I'm like, no, I don't want to see them. She was kind of surprised by that. I, I, I mean, I could have like got her all her questions and then prepared the answer for each one. I have no idea what she's going to ask me. Um, so that should make it pretty entertaining. Um, but I'm, I'm up for it. So well, you're going to play kind of the newbie inventor. You're going to ask some of these questions. I'm going to answer them. Are you going to also, Courtney, give some expand on my answer too, and then play because you're a coach at our other business invent right as well and expand on it as well. Or are you just yeah. going to ask the questions? Yeah, I'll, I'll give a couple of them. I'll, I'll let you shine for the most part. And then there's a couple of tidbits that I uh, tell my students and I'll definitely chime in and and let you guys know my thoughts on the barrier or excuse as well. Okay. All right. I'm ready. Okay. So we've got a lot of barriers and excuses we uh, uphold as inventors. There's a lot of different ones. We're going to start with maybe a couple of easier ones, and then we're just going to go down the list and get into some harder, deeper mental discussions. Sounds good to me. So the first thing I have is I need a prototype. Andrew, I, you know, I, I have this product idea. Uh, mm -hmm. and I want to make a prototype. I need a prototype. That's the very first step is I need to make that prototype. I need like a 3D printer or I, maybe I need to get a sample or manufacture it. And then like I can look at it and then send the, the sample to a company. I just, I just need it. And I just don't know where to start with a prototype. That's, that's kind mm -hmm. of a heavy deal. And I just, I don't know what to do at that point. So I'm, sure. I'm stuck there. So for, for these answers that I'm going to give, some of you that are invent rights students or you've been following us for a while on our YouTube show or you've just been attending a lot of IGA meetings, you're going to know some of this stuff. But some of you guys that are new, especially, are going to be pretty surprised by some of my answers. So And it won't necessarily go the direction that you're thinking. So working on a prototype is never, ever, 100%, never the first thing to do. What? Ever. ever. Sorry, go on. Ever. Um, you know, and, and, and I, I'm going to explain why now it might be pretty early on in the game. And I'm talking about a crude prototype where you cannibalize something, duct tape something together or something fancy. It should never, ever be the first thing you do. The first thing you do should always be 100% of the time studying the micro category of your invention. So if it's a barbecue spatula or a medic magnetic doorstop or something like that, let's say it's a magnetic doorstop. You need to have studied every magnetic, when you come up with this idea, oh, this is so cool, it's gonna make it easy to keep the door open, but then close it and then the magnet's gonna hit there. Your micro category is magnetic doorstops. You need to get on Google images and you need to be familiar with every magnetic doorstop because if you start working on a prototype, if you start doing this and that, and it's, why would you ever do that without knowing where you're going with this product? The sooner you come up with the product idea that you study the micro category, you're going to realize there's these other products, they have these other benefits, these price points, and you're going to be more flexible with your mind in changing your product if it wasn't right from the get-go. But the longer you start playing with it and dreaming about it and thinking about it, it becomes more fixed in your brain. So you should never, ever, 100% of the time, come up with an idea and start working on a prototype. I don't care how much fun you think it is, and it, is, it can be fun, for others it can be painful, is you wanna study the micro category. And Google Images and Amazon are the best ways of doing that. There's some industrial products that aren't gonna be on Amazon, but on Google Images, it's a great way to do that. And when you're doing that searching, your goal isn't to prove nothing like my product exists and everything else sucks, which is kind of the attitude a lot of people do when they go into studying a micro category subconsciously. It's like, I need to understand this space. How does my product fit in? So you absolutely don't need a prototype 
um, up front. Now, does it mean you're not going to make a prototype? No, it just means you're not going to do it first. So what was the question initially, Courtney? No, it's just saying that I need a prototype. And one thing that I, I will say uh, okay. is great about this is you often don't need an expensive one. You often don't even need a physical one either. Often virtual prototypes work beautifully for it. It depends. But the most important thing that Andrew is mentioning here is that it is not the first step. And if you're you're saying, I can't do this because I, you know, I, I don't know where to start. I, I don't know what to do with a prototype. I need a prototype. You're already losing because you have to do that market research first. That is the most important thing that I see. Even my own students who are coming into the program at InventRight say that, that they've done the market research. They're totally good to go. Let's get that prototype and sell sheet made and let's start pitching. And we got to slow down uh, because that perspective that Andrew just mentioned is so real. You don't want to see your product out there. You're hoping it's not out there. So you're using keywords in Google trying to get around the reality of what products are out there and you want them to be out there. You want to see similar products out there. You want there to be market mm. demand, proof of demand out there. It's even scarier when you don't have any products out there that are similar. That's even worse. So definitely like Andrew said, you want to you want to shift your mentality, your perspective into finding your product out there, not being scared that you will find it. Now, and nine and a half times out of 10, when I see non-invent right students do their research, it's not good enough. Like I talk to inventors all the time that are invent right students. They tell me what it is. There's nothing like, there's nothing like it. I search a keyword on, on, on Google images and I'm like, there it is. Now, don't perceive me saying that your purpose for doing the research is not to prove there's nothing like your product and your product is great. Your, the purpose for doing your research is to it's relevant if you find the exact same thing. Of course, that's relevant. But how does it fit in amongst all these other products? So let's say you do your research and you're like, okay, now I got to make a prototype. Now, the question is, could you just look at similar things? And so when you did a marketing piece, and you do a virtual prototype and a sell sheet and the company is like, well, how do we make this? And you're like, well, there's that product and that product. And all I did is put a hinge on it. And they're like, oh, okay. If you can do a virtual prototype and a marking piece that illustrates the benefit of the product, that's good enough because you are not selling your prototype. You're selling the benefit of your product. So if you do a good marking piece where they can see how they would sell to their customer, that's all you need to do. Now, after you've done your research, if you're like, you know, I want to kind of, let's say it's a dog toy. I want to see if my dog likes this thing. So I'm going to go down to Petco. I'm going to pick up this dog toy. It's kind of like it. I'm going to duct tape another piece onto it and have my, my dog play with it to see if it works. Perfectly valid time to make a prototype. Perfectly okay. But you got to ask yourself, is it necessary? With a lot of products, it's like, I know this is going to work. I can't make this prototype, but I know the company could. And I know this product's going to make sense, but sometimes you do want to play with it. You do want to tinker with it. So it's just not the very first thing you do but it can be the next thing you do after you do your research, if you could do something simple. But if you're like, I know this is gonna work, I'm not even gonna mess with it, then don't do it. But if you're like, you can make something pretty simple and you wanna play with it and test it, perfectly fine, nothing wrong with that. Now, speaking of that, Andrew, uh, I definitely get this question a lot and I'm sure you definitely do. And it gets me quite heated, the, the most heated excuse that I hear. And I know you're gonna have a great answer for this. So I wanna jump right into these, these scary waters here and we're gonna just get this one out of the way. Okay. And that is, if I talk about my invention, someone will steal it. I refuse to search on Google. Oh God. It becomes public knowledge. So I can't, what this do I do? I'm done, right? There's, thing there's I've no heard. Licensing for yes, me. Google is tracking everything you do. I've been watching some videos on YouTube, yes but not for the purposes of stealing your idea, just for the purposes of, of um, sending you advertising. And yes, we're all worried, well, some of us are worried that if, the, if somebody could get into Google and get a hold of that, they can see everywhere you've gone with Google Maps and they're tracking everything you do. And so if somebody got a hold of that information, yes, that would be bad, but, but Google is not going in and nobody's going into your searches to go, oh, they search for this and then expounding upon, oh, that would be a good product. So I'm gonna steal their invention. My God, no, that is such an utterly ridiculous 
level of inventor paranoia. That's ridiculous. The fact that you're Googling certain keywords and somebody's going to figure out what you're trying to research and get access to that and then steal your idea. My God, no, that's ridiculous. That's, Perfect. That's, that's not going to, if you're thinking that, just give up now. That's just, that's just a waste of your time. You heard it from Andrew. You heard what he just said. Make sure you're writing this down because you're, you guys may be listening, but then you'll go off. And the first thing you'll think is why well, I can't search it. And it's all going to go right over because again, we're stuck in these perspectives. It's okay. It's valid. It makes sense. Someone will steal it, but you heard it right now from Andrew. Definitely write some notes down because you're going to come back to this and, and realize that. It I, I hear that every sense. once in a while. I don't, I don't think most inventors are that paranoid. If they are, that you, you and if you're out there and you don't have to raise your hand as to who you are, get over it. You're you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna rip. I, I say I like saying this because it's true. Most inventors, not you guys, you're showing up. You're like trying to get yourself educated. But most inventors rip themselves off out of their own fears by never showing your product to any company. You just ripped yourself off. The company didn't rip you off. That is a thousand times more common than a company ripping off an inventor that showed him a product. In the 21 years InventRight's been around, I am not aware of a student of ours at InventRight that has showed to potential licensees that got ripped off. I've never been informed of a student that that happened to them. But I talk to people, inventors every day, they're so paranoid and they're just wanting to fork out tens of thousands of dollars to patent attorneys because of their fear when they could file a $75 provisional and go fishing off the end of the pier for a year to license it. So, um, get, and you know, there's always a new inventor. You guys need to hear this. And for some of you, you're like, I know this, Andrew, but for some of you that are new, you might not. So it's, and thank you for asking that question, Courtney. Yeah, absolutely. I think a good sum of that is don't let fear drive you. Let education propel you forward. How many uh, questions do you have? I feel like I'm talking too long in each one. And maybe I need to go shorter on each I've one. I've got a lot of them. Yeah, let's, let's All right. go through <laughs> these a little quicker. Uh, I can't quit my day job. Uh, I don't have the time. I'm just, you know, busy. I just, I just don't have the capacity to be able to think about my ideas. I want to do it. I just don't have time. Yeah. What, so I always tell people, if you have two to six hours a week, you have enough time to license your products. You're not starting a business. You don't need to hire employees. You don't need to mortgage your house and home. If you can spend two to six hours a week on efficient things that move yourself forward, that's plenty. You, you don't need any more than that. You're not starting a business. Sometimes people say, you know, your spouse might say, well, honey, how can you do that? You don't have all that money, you know, for a patent and you don't, you can't start a business. It's like, I'm not starting a business. I'm going to spend the time to license it to a company and then they're going to take it from there. Their money their workforce and their existing distribution. So um, you can do it two to six hours a week. And one thing that I've noticed over 21 years of InventRight is it's not about going crazy one week and then not doing anything for three. The people that I see are successful is they're continually every week plodding along, pl you know, reaching out to companies, doing stuff every week, two to six hours a week. So it's more of a marathon than it is a sprint. Yeah, it's okay to go crazy one week, do a lot. But if you do it in fits and starts, I don't find that works for most people. And when you make it a habit, there's a lot of talk out there, books and on, you know, the internet, how important habits are. There's a bunch of habit trackers you can get for an Android or iPhone. When you make it a habit and it's every week, but it's hard for people to make something a habit when they don't know what to do. So you could spend two to six hours a week, but if you don't know what you're doing, you're going in circles two to six hours a week. When you really know what you're doing and you're focusing on things that are effective, you can get a lot done in two to six hours a week. Yeah, very well said. And two to six hours is, is not a big commitment. And another way, again, we're changing that perspective is instead of saying, I don't have time, think about that you're choosing to not spend time on it. What about you waiting in line at a coffee shop? Are you waiting in line to pick up your kid? Or are you waiting for dinner to cook? Uh, or just waiting in some respect, there's so much you can do for education or pitching or market research that just takes a good five minutes while you have to wait anyways, while you're doing something else. 
That's a great mm-hmm. way to utilize time. You always have time. It's just how are you u- utilizing it and what are the little spaces that you can throw in education, your passion, you'll get excited about it. Those five minutes will, will change into 20 minutes and then you'll find a good 20 minutes, you know, every day to start working on it. And that is fantastic. If you can get 20 minutes in just every so often here and there, there's a massive amount of difference between no time at all. In just a couple minutes, you can get your market research done in a week with 20 minutes every single day. Well, so let's talk minutes. about that. So what are some of the things you can do with very short periods of time? I think there is a benefit, Courtney, of jumping in and doing an hour or two at a time, big benefit. But um, our LinkedIn for licensing expert, Ben, he's like, I have my phone. I'm like pumping gas. I'm like clicking accept on some connections on LinkedIn. Um, or I'm just doing another Google image search on a product idea I had, or looking for some additional companies or just going to walmart.com and seeing who's selling doorstops and then bookmarking those. There are things you can do in 20 or 30 minutes. Some people though, I think have a hard time getting going. So I was telling this to one of our students the other day, like when you get going and you're reaching out to companies on LinkedIn or on the phone, like you're hitting your stride. And it took you like 20 minutes to get the nerve up to start reaching out to companies. You starting to hit your stride. If you can try to go like a full two hours, don't go, oh, I got a few into a few companies. Like you're feeling good. Like, hey, if you can get into 10 instead of two, spend a little extra time. But, um, and I think then setting aside the time, like if you say, look, Monday and Tuesday, I'm going to work on my project projects. And if I don't get my four hours in, I'm going to now put in some time on Thursday and Friday. And if I still don't, hey, I'm going to do Saturday and I'm never going to leave the week ended by Sunday. You can do whatever criteria you want. That's just an example without having put four hours in. I find that our students that do that sort of thing and are very consistent about putting the work in, if they have just so-so ideas and they put the work in, they're going to license way before that, whoa, that inventor has this really cool idea that half-asses the work. And so most of licensing is not about the idea. It's about the work. And yeah, the work is a thousandth of the work of running a business, but you still got to do the work. You still got to put your two to six hours in every week. And hey, if you're between jobs or careers, maybe you can put 20 hours in. That's great, but it's not necessary to be successful. Yeah. And as you're creating those habits, I'd really recommend uh, what I recommend, which is you're going to have a timer for one minute every single day. If you use a calendar of sorts on your phone, like a digital calendar, set a timer. We're talking one minute every single day where you just have to sit or stand and think about inventing. You're not necessarily doing market research. You could, you could open a LinkedIn, but your goal is to not do anything. No multitasking, no thinking about what you're going to make for dinner. It's just one minute to think about it. You want to kickstart that habit. One minute feels doable. We're not talking five minutes, not talking an hour a day, but if you can get that habit going for one minute, Every single day, your mind will will continue to uh, get more interested and more passionate about your ideas, and then you will find the time to do the things you're passionate about. Uh, Let's get into some of these other ones here, Uh, some big ones such as, I don't have the money, Andrew. I don't have the money. I don't have the money for the patent, Uh, the prototype. We'll get into patents in a second, but just in general, I just... I don't have the money. What, what can I do? Can I do anything at all? Is this just not right for me? Cause I just well, don't have money. You know, sometimes I, I talk to people that literally don't have two pennies to rub together. And I tell them you need to get a job. You know, you need to get a job because if you're not paying your utility bill or what have you, you shouldn't be licensing because it's not about the money. Cause I can tell you right now, you can, you can do licensing with next to no money, but not no money. Right. But, um, If you're like have struggling paying your utility bills or your rent or your mortgage, you got to focus on bringing in enough money where you're doing those things because there's there's a point at which that's too stressful to start a new endeavor. Okay, but if you're like most people, you're not in that 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 field. And so instead of 10 or 12,000 for a patent, spend seventy five dollars on a provisional and that gives you a whole year to finish off the pier. Um, you know, spend a few bucks, get a virtual prototype and a sell sheet done. So, you know, for a lot of products, not all products, but a lot of products, you can literally be in the game for less than $300 investment. And so when this big company could sell 20,000, 50,000, a hundred thousand quarter million units a year, and you're getting a royalty quite often 5%, don't say that to the company because you can get higher sometimes. 
Um, and so you could be potentially earning, you know, depends on the product, guys. It can vary. 10,000 a year, 20, 50, 100, 200K a year. It depends on the product, how well it does. Um, Ryan, this with this product, I'm not going to say how much. He's he's earning an insane amount of money on this, this product that he licensed. I'm not, we don't like selling get rich quick and invent, right? So I'm not going to mention it, but it's, it's crazy money. Um, not everybody's going to do that kind of money, but he is. And so anybody, as long as you're not the one that doesn't have two pennies to rub together, you know, and you have a couple hundred bucks, you can work on licensing your products. And what that does, it gives you the financial bandwidth. If you don't license one to always move on the next, but if you spend 15 K on a patent and 5,000 on a prototype on every idea you come up with, um, then you're not going to be doing this very long. Your spouse, yourself, you're just not going to keep investing in your products if, if you can't license one. So this gives you the financial bandwidth to do this forever. You'll never run out of money. That's a beautiful thing. No, very well said. $300, at least to me, feels like a pretty low bar. If you guys can rack up $300. And I'm not saying every product you can do that. I'm not saying that, but I'm saying for a lot of products, you can get away with that. Absolutely. And we're not talking thousands and thousands full utility yeah. patents. And speaking of that, let's get into that. Uh, patents. I need a full utility patent as the first thing I do. And then I can start, you know, working with a company or pitching or, you know, going through the process. But I got to get you my utility patent. Got to make sure it's protected. I got to spend, you know, I got to hire someone, maybe 10,000, maybe a little less, hopefully. And then I'll start working on it. What do you Or, or even about? worse, I'll, I'll go you one worse, even stupider than that. Um, is I have to wait till my patent issues because they're not going to license for me until the patent issues. BS to both those things. You don't need an issued patent and you don't need a utility patent pending. A provisional patent is just fine. And when you put it on your sell sheet, it can, you can legally say patent pending with a provisional. It doesn't have to be provisional patent pending. They don't know the difference one way or another and they can't see it. There's no way they can see it. Now, when you file a full utility, after 18 months, even if it hasn't been issued yet, the public can see it. So I see a provisional in some ways as being stronger in that yeah. nobody can see it or look at it than even a pending utility patent because after 18 months, the world can see it and they can see what claims you're trying to get. Now, don't worry. A lot of you have gone out and filed patents and I'm not saying you should never do that, but you, you didn't realize that you could take the invent right approach and file a provisional and get the whole year the patent office gives you. And if you know how to license, you'll never need a year on 95% of products. There are some products that can really drag due to their nature, but so that's my answer to that. No, very well said. And of course, we're giving business advice. We cannot give legal advice, yeah. uh, but I will say uh, that my first four products and now my last two, I had one provisional patent application on my very first product that I licensed. It expired. I chose not to file another PPA. The company was interested in it. They liked it and they took all four of my products to market with no protection. And same with the two that I just licensed a couple of weeks ago no protection at all. Again, we're not saying no, you know, we, we definitely recommend PPAs, uh, but because it's your own journey, you get to decide what you want to do. And I personally decided to file for that one. And then because I've developed that relationship, which is everything, the relationship is everything with the company. They didn't care about it. So I chose to not spend my time in an area that the company chooses not to spend their time in because I'm working with them. I didn't file. Yeah, let's address that. People are like, well, if I'm not selling in my patent, never use that word, people. Yes. Never say I want to sell you my patent to a company ever. You're licensing the product to them. That's amateur hour. Because when you do a licensing agreement, you're renting or leasing it to them. If they don't perform, you take it back. So you never use the word selling and you never use the word patent. And you definitely don't use them both together. So you're, you're renting or you're licensing it to them. That sounds more, you don't say I want to rent you my idea, but that's essentially what it is. Um, so yeah, those are some things, some, some thing not, things not to do. What's up next? All right. So our next one here is I can't take, and I've got a really good uh, answer for this, but I want to hear what you say first, Andrew. Okay. I can't take all of the no's. It's too much rejection. I got my first no. It's painful. I don't want to do this anymore. No one likes my product. Uh, and I think I'm, I'm just done. It's been two months. I've gotten one no. I've sent the sell sheet out to many companies. I've gotten one no. And I just, I think it's time to move on. I mean, what do you think, Andrew? It's just a lot of no's. It's kind of painful. Um, 
It's not, it's, it's all depends on how you see it. So when you get a no from a company, yes, they said no to that product, but they said yes to seeing the product. So now you've established that relationship. So when they say no to your product, you should say, fantastic. I said in this one product and now I made the relationship. So now I got another cat toy or another doorstop or another something in their category. All I have their email, all I have to do is send it to them. So you didn't get a no, you got a no to the product but you didn't get a no to receiving another idea. So you made a connection so you can feel good about it. Um, and I think that part of this is inventors see themselves, most of you have multiple ideas, but you're so focused on that first product, you're not thinking beyond it. Yeah. And so when you know that you benefited from creating that relationship, then it's a little easier to take the no. You know, now they still said no to the product, but I'll say this, you know, and this will shock some of you, but some of them actually liked your product. So the company didn't say no, the person said no. So you reached out, you, you went on LinkedIn, for example, or called, and you noticed there was this marketing manager, his name is Bob, and you sent it to Bob. But Bob has, is getting 200 emails a day. He's got three projects, the dude's overwhelmed. He sees your product, he likes it, but he tells you no. He doesn't want to give you an inkling that you, he likes it because then you're just going to hound him forever. So he's going to tell you no. So realize some of these no's, they're actually interested in your product. And I'm saying this a lot lately to the public and to our students. So reach out six or eight months later. And when you get these non-specific no's, resend all those people. Now, do not resend to people that say no, because this, this, and this. And you're like, I can't fix that. That's obnoxious. You know, but they won't remember you half the time. They, the next time you send to them six or eight months later, um, it might just be timing. And their boss said, we need new products. And they're like, even though they're overwhelmed with their project still, they're like, this is a priority now. And they're seeing the same product. And now they're showing interest in your product. So if you reach out to 30 companies and they all say, no, to me, you're not done. You could reach out to them all again, six or eight months later, I get students licensing all the time that way, our invent right students. Now, I only started giving this advice about nine years ago because people were crying because they didn't license their first product. And I had ulterior motives. I just wanted to get them onto their second product and go be more professional, move on to the second one. So I was kind of like, I didn't know it would work so well. Just, you know, look, don't throw it in the garbage can, put it in the closet. And then we started to see it working. And now that's a standard approach that we take. And it will help you. So the combination of like, yes, I got to know, but I made a contact. I feel good about something and that it's not over yet. And so sometimes people will have 30 companies and they'll reach out to 15 and they're like, oh, no, maybe this isn't working. Maybe I'm going to the next, next one. And I'm like, you filed a PPA. You did a sell sheet. You did your research. Are you kidding me? You're not done until you get no's from all of them. Just started. Yeah, you just started. So that's did I rant? I think I that was fantastic. You am I yelling? My heart am I that's... yelling? I, I, I hope so. Of... <laughs> no, that was fantastic, Andrew. Thank you very much for that. Uh, and I will bounce off of that and say that your first product that you are pitching to a company is the vessel, the boat to the relationship that you are now creating. It's just the you're, you you got to give them something. You got to throw that noodle on the wall and let it stick. Let them look at it. Uh, and then, yes, it'd be great if, if they said yes immediately. That would be wonderful. But if you change your perspective to, I'm just hoping for that yes to, I just want to develop a relationship. I want to get to know you. I want to hear what products you're looking for, how often you review them, how inventor friendly you are, what is the submission. Then you change the focus on not being so uh, feeling pressured to get that deal to, I want to develop a relationship. And now you're acting like a professional inventor. It's not the product. It's the relationship you're developing. And that should get you excited. But most inventors are so focused on that first product, they're not thinking like this. So if you think like this, it will reduce your anxiety. If you know you reached out to 30 freaking companies and they all said no, that you're not done. Now, also, you want to get feedback. Maybe your sell sheet sucks. I mean, like when I see sell sheets, I mean, I'm, I'm using these words because I feel them from the bottom of my heart, I know this is true. When I see sell sheets from non-invent right students, nine times out of 10, they're garbage. You guys think you're doing good marketing and you're not. 
So do you want to reach out to 30 companies and they're not showing interest because they don't even understand your product? And then a very small percentage I see from non-event rights students are okay. But you don't want okay. You want, I get it in six to 10 seconds. So I'll give you guys this tip that all you guys can use, regardless of your event rights student or whoever, put the cell sheet on your computer, desktop, laptop, doesn't matter as long as you can stand behind the computer. This will only work for people that you've never talked to the product about before. I don't care if it's a super supportive or super unsupportive family or friend or a stranger, okay? Put it on your computer, stand behind the computer and just look at them and see if there's confusion on their face and listen to the questions they ask. Do not answer any questions. So if they're answer, asking a bunch of questions and they're stating what they think it is, and if they're not getting it, your sell sheet is not good enough and you need to fix it. So this is a free way of, of testing that doesn't require a professional marketing person or what have you. And if, it's, if they're not getting it, oh yeah, I see the doorstop does this and that. And it's like, okay, it's good. If they're like, um, does it do this? Um, you know, and if it's not happening and normally I say six to 10 seconds, but let's say you could give them 20, not good enough. Now you got to do enough people. Maybe the person is just really clueless, you know? So if you know the person, you know, you can kind of judge that. So if you did that with like four or five or six people, you could figure out if your marketing piece is good enough. No, that's great, Andrew. And before we go on to the next question, I would like to add something which I've never mentioned publicly. So this will be the, the debut of this tip, uh, which is the my own personal 99 nose rule. And this is a perspective, not necessarily a goal. So keep that in mind. Uh, you're going to pretend that the hundredth no or now yes that you reach out to. So you're going to reach out to 100 companies eventually. Uh, and your goal is to get 99 no's with the assumption that that 100th one you reach out to is a contract. Like they've got the contract there. They are waiting for you right now in this second. They are waiting for you. They've got the contract. It's exactly what you want. It's on the table. They've got the pen. And they're like, where is this person? Like, come over and, and sign it already. Like, let's, let's do this deal. Like, it's it's there. But you have, it's just, it's just over there. It's not right here. It's just a little far. So is this basically a visualization technique that you're, you're giving? Like yeah, you got to so just pretend like that's true, feel yes. it's true, believe it's true and try to get to a hundred companies. It, yeah, it, that, and it also helps relieve the pressure off of every single no. When, when you get every no, you're like, oh, that's okay. That one was bad, but the next company is going to be good or that's okay. But the next company is going to be yes. Yeah. And you always put that pressure on yourself. So if you just relieve it and say, you will not get a contract until that a hundredth one, then you can get through those weeds. You can say, that's okay. It's my 20th. No. So I still got a hundred. I still got to get there. Hopefully you get a license before the hundred. It took me 81 to get my product license. Hopefully it's before that. It may be a little after that, but just the perspective change of, of attempting to get to a hundred relieves that pressure of, I'm so frustrated. It's been three months. I've gotten you know, 10 no's, I think I'm just, I'm just done. I just, I'm tired of it. And it's, again, it's so mental. So try using that as well uh, to help you be more uh, persistent and persevere more, have more grit to get to that licensing deal. Don, Donna wrote, um, some products don't have a hundred companies that manufacture that product. That's true. But if that's the case, you know, you might reach out to 30 on one and 40 on another. And, and because I think, if, if you feel like this one product is all you're ever going to work on, you might as well just throw in the towel right now. Wrong attitude. So now if you're Tremaine focused now, fine. But to say to yourself, like, I'm never going to do this again, you should have it in your mind. I'm going to be working on more products. So in that case, you will get to 100. And you might license your first product, your second or your third product. But one thing that we know at InventRight is it's a numbers game. And if you don't play that numbers game, you, you will not win. And most inventors that reach out to companies when they're licensing, like literally I talk to inventors and our invent rights students and like they'll reach out to two or three or they're like, well, I reach out to my favorite until I hear back from them. I can't call others. I'm like, oh, your time. That's ridiculous. Don't do that. Um, so it's important that you guys hear that. But it is a numbers game. Um, and you can always come back around to project number one. Like you yeah. get 30 no's, 
put it in the closet for a while, work on project number two, wait about six months, send it back to all those people. Maybe you make some tweaks to your marketing if you felt like your presentation wasn't good. It's just most of licensing is sweeping the floor. Once you know what to do, it's very boring. It's very mundane. It's not as fun as the ideation, the creation. Once you accept that and you're an automaton, a robot about it, that's when you're going to be successful. But most creative people don't want to do that drudgery. That it, it like most creative people aren't also salespeople. Salespeople realize just numbers. I don't think what you're doing with licensing is sales. You're just showing them how you're going to make money. But the part of being a salesperson is this persistent, consistent, never-ending outreach that every salesperson has to make. And if you don't accept that you're going to have to do that, you won't be successful with licensing. If you do, you can have pretty so-so ideas and you will eventually be successful. You do not need to be great ideas. I'm always yeah. blown away um, by some ideas that our students are, are working on licensing. That I'm just like, yeah, that makes sense, but it's not like, whoa. But companies are very uncreative. Corporate America does not foster creative feelings. So you, you don't need to be hyper creative or super clever in order to come up with stuff that they're not coming up with. Yeah. And the other thing to, to Donna's point, I will mention is I get that a lot with my students of Courtney, you know, I've got 30 and I can't do more like there aren't any more. And often we decide, I don't want to call it laziness, but a lot of us just have a feeling that there aren't any more. And I get on that call and I can find a good 10, 15 more. And if they push, I say, just, just try, just try this new tactic. And you would not believe how every single one of my students are coming back and say, I found 50 more took me three hours. I found 50 more. And I told you on the last call, there were no companies. Again, it's a barrier. It is very true that there are in some niche areas that there are not a hundred. That is definitely true, but there are way um, fewer areas that that is true for. So just push yourself a little bit more and you would be amazed at how much the real Courtney, how are. many questions do you have? Are we, are we, I think we're probably talking too long on each no, one. We're, we're doing good. Yeah. We, we've okay. got a, we've got a couple here that, that we'll want to get through here, uh, which is uh, I don't want to put in the hard work, Andrew. Uh, I'd rather pay someone else to do it. Uh, and so I just, can I just pay someone some money and, and just have them get my product out there? So at, at InventRight, we talk to people every day, every other day at the very least um, that have been scammed by invention promotion companies. They're not stealing your idea. They don't care about your idea. They'll, they'll tell you whatever you have. They tell us the greatest things since sliced bread. And they're going to ask for 10 or 12K. Some of them will ask for three or four K at a time. It's almost always ends up being 10 or 12K. They're going to pretend to work on it. Usually the contract just says, we need to submit your idea to industry, which could mean that over a period of a year, they send five spam emails to some random company and they've met their contractual obligation to you. This is shocking. I have never talked to an inventor in 21 years of been doing InventRight that has ever licensed a product with an invention promotion company. But every day, every other day, we talk to somebody who's been taken for 10 or 12 grand. Sometimes they're licking their wounds and it happened 10 years ago. Sometimes it happened a year ago. And so if you're not willing to reach out for your own products to companies that can license them and you know what's happening because you're freaking doing it. But if you're going to rely on somebody else to do it, you're just going to find an endless list of shyster companies that want to take your money, tell you they're going to do it and they're not going to do SHIT with it. They are I'm not. And when people are new, they're like, but it makes sense. Andrew inventors have ideas. There should be a company that reaches out for them. But what they've found is easier to take advantage of inventors than actually do the work. They would probably have to charge 30, 40 K to really do the work at 10. They love doing pretending to do the work at 10 or 12 K. And they have this huge profit margin because they're not doing SHIT. And that's, it's sad, but it's true. And they're not stealing your ideas, guys. Sometimes I get people that are like, oh, I'm really worried. I was with this invention promotion company. They didn't do anything. I'm like, but they have, they have my idea. I think they're going to steal it. I'm like, they're not interested. They're interested in your money, not your idea. They couldn't license their way out of a paper bag. And some of them, they do these ploys too. Like, oh, we want 20% of your invention. You know, the, the, the royalties and the inventors all worried. And I'm like, that's just a ploy to get the 10 or 12K out of you. So 
if you guys are looking for that, and I know it's weird, there's nobody legit out there that does that. You're just going to find an endless list of con artists that are happy to do it for you. Nothing will come from it. Well said, Andrew. The other thing I'll mention is that no one will rep your product better than you. So always keep that in mind as well. Yeah. Uh, the other thing is, okay, so our, our next question is, uh, all of my ideas are out there already. I did a search and they're out there. Every single idea I come up with, it's out there. So I just feel like licensing is not fit for me because I can't come up with a decent idea. Well, you know, first off, I think when you come up with an idea, which most inventors don't do this, but if you, the very first thing you do is you study the micro category and I, people, people say, oh crap, it's out there. And I'm like, well, you've been kind of excited about this. You should immediately study all the other products in that space and go, well, I've been thinking about this for a while now. Why don't I see if I can make a tweak based on all the other products out there? So if you come up with an idea and you find that exact same thing, I wouldn't ever stop there. I would study all the other products and go, maybe I just need to tweak here or tweak there and move forward yes. with the product. Very, very powerful. Yeah. And often it's, it's not, I mean, it's out there and you want to see that proof of demand, but often your idea is slightly different. And if it's not, there's usually a lot of room for you to make it different. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what if all my ideas are too big? I've got the, the next biggest thing. Uh, and uh, I think it's uh, going to be the thing of 2022. And so it's a really big deal. I need a big prototype first, you know, going back to that again. And then what do I do at this point? Like is licensing for only small ideas? And then at that point, what do I do? Do I venture? Well, it's, it's a big deal. I never know. Every inventor has a different idea of what's big. You know, I mean, every other inventor well thinks said. the idea is big. And it, it could be a novelty gag gift that you end up licensing some mom and pop company. It's not going to, or it could be a product that's going to be like in every Walmart and Target and Lowe's and Home Depot. And so what do you, how do you define big, Courtney? What do you, how do you define that? So I, I get a lot of emails from uh, various inventors who say that it's going to do, in fact, here's another one that we can, we can double this question here. Uh, I will get uh, some emails that I'll say like, I will only want to license my idea if it's to a large conglomerate company. It's the best thing since sliced bread. It's a big innovation. Uh, I want to have multiple licensing deals with a 15% royalty because it seems more than fair. Uh, and so what do I do at that point? Do you want to see it? <laughs> well, I don't know if I want to talk to that person, but I'll talk to them <laughs> help get real. But um, so first off, this perception that if you license your product to multiple companies instead of one that you're going to make more money is ridiculous. Now, I talk to inventors where I'm like, oh, no, you could license that to multiple companies, but you're not going to license to multiple companies that are stepping on each other's toes. So you're not going to license to three companies that all sell in Walmart the exact same product. Then one doesn't have a leg up on the other. It doesn't make sense. But if you're licensing to a different geography, a different version of the product, maybe a really low price product, really high price product, or a different version that's going to sell somewhere else, as long as when you license to one company, the new company is not going to be stepping on their toes and not going to hurt their sales, then you can license to multiple. Most of the time, you're going to be licensing to one company. And if it's a really big company, you should be happy with that. Or if you send it to all the companies and it ends up being a medium-sized company and you couldn't get a really big one, then that's fine. But also, sometimes licensing to a medium-sized company that has big plans for your product is actually better than licensing to a big company that has small ideas for your product. Oh, we're just going to test it on a website or two. So when you get interest, don't assume the company size is equal to what they can do. You got to interview them about what they're going to do with it and evaluate it. It might, might be much better to license to a medium-sized company than that big one because that big one has small ideas for your product. So you can't just evaluate the size of the company, what their plans are. And you shouldn't just, you should reach out to smaller companies as well. You're under no obligation if they show interest and they might have big plans for it. I know of one, I can't mention it, but I know of one where that was perfectly true um, very recently. Great. Uh, our next question here is, I don't have the skills or the right path, and then therefore I'm afraid of failure, or we could even say afraid of success, depending on how deep we want to get here. I'm afraid of burning bridges, doing it wrong, and so I don't have the right path, what, and I don't you know, have the skills. I, I've been thinking about this a lot lately, just because the past couple of days, actually, recently, and I, I don't think you need to be very smart to license. 
I don't think you need to be very creative to license. So sometimes it's the plumber or the housewife that I see being more successful than some dude that's like a former CEO and they're retired. Sometimes the people with a lot of business background, they're a little arrogant and they're not listening to their coach is the next thing to do. So it's the person that has no business background, but says to their coach, okay, that's what you want me to do. I'm going to do it. And they just do it and they take action as opposed to the guy. Well, I know what I'm doing. I've been in business. And it's like, well, yeah, I know you launch products, but licensing is a different animal. You need to, you need to listen. This is what works. You know, so I don't think you need to be experienced in business. I don't think you need to be even intelligent. I don't think you need to be super creative. I think you just need to do the freaking work. So I, I, I really, truly believe that after doing InventRight for 21 years. Um, yeah. yeah. I completely agree. Uh, we've got three questions left. So let's see if we can rapid fire these. Um, I feel like I need someone to do it with me. I personally am not self-motivated. I have a hard time with, with, you know, forming those habits. Like you mentioned, I feel like I need someone to do it with me. I don't want to do it on my own. Uh, what do you say to, to someone who feels like they can't do it with just themselves? Well, I feel a little awkward answering that question because I, I would say sign up for InventRight and get a coach and they'll make you comfortable. And now it's something that you're comfortable doing on your own is familiar. But if you're not gonna do that, I would say once you do something and you become comfortable with it, it's because you're not comfortable with it. There's something in your life that you've done before and you do it over and over and over again, and you're comfortable, and you don't even think about it. So whether you have an InventRight coach or somebody else guiding you to get comfortable with licensing, once you get comfortable with it, anybody can do it. Like I said, you don't need to be intelligent or super creative or have a business background at all. You just need to do the right steps. So get, get in your comfort zone and just, just do it. And you will be uncomfortable for a period of time. But once you have the real experience, not reading a book or watching a video, that's not doing it. You think you know it. You don't know something until you actually do it. So however you do it, whether it's getting an event right coach or doing it on your own or having somebody else guide you through it that's done licensing deals, but be very careful. Don't, if somebody doesn't, hasn't experienced licensing before, don't get help from them. There's a lot of business advisors out there. They don't know how licensing works. They know how to launch a product, but they don't know how licensing works. Don't listen to them. They don't know how they're clueless as to how licensing works. So you need to find somebody that understands licensing. And yeah, do your due diligence for sure. Okay. And then uh, two more. One is I am not tech savvy. Uh, do I need to be tech savvy? What kind of tech skills do I need to be successful here? Sometimes I get people that, you know, older people or sometimes younger people and like they can barely turn on a computer that worries me. And, but I don't think not having money is ever a reason because you can pick up a used PC. I'm a Mac guy, but you can pick up a used PC. You can even pick up a used Mac for, you can pick up a used Mac laptop for 200 bucks, 220 bucks, you know? So there's, there's no money reason why you do not need a fancy computer to do this. Now, if you've never used LinkedIn before, you need to learn. You don't need to learn how to do everything on a computer. If I had to summarize, you need to be able to send or receive an email. You need to be able to attach something to an, e an email. You need to be able to use LinkedIn. If you don't know how, you need to learn. Um, you, you need to be able to use the phone, make a phone call. <laughs> That's not very hard. So I, I think some people have like, I'm old. I don't know how to do this. And you need to figure it out. But you don't need to learn all the tech savvy stuff. You just need to learn a few little things and you know how to do those. And if you don't know, you need to have somebody, you need to take a course and just do those really basic things. But you do not need to be a computer geek. But if you don't know how to attach a sell sheet to an email, you need to learn before you start trying to license. Just going to say that that's definitely an important thing to learn how to attach uh, PDFs. That's important. And if you can do that and do a test, you know, send it to a, a family member or whoever is helping you out, make sure it's good. And as long as you can get that done and pick up a phone, you're in, in good hands. Usually people that don't have those skills, they've been beating themselves up or their family says, oh, Bob, he doesn't know how to use a computer. And screw that. Anybody can learn those skills. I think that's BS. I don't care how old or young you are. You just got to suck it up and do that. It's good. That's not knowing how to do those things is going to hurt you in other aspects of your life too. 
And it just makes you look so clueless, but do not beat yourself up. You can learn those skills. You can use lynda.com as a great website to yeah. learn how to use these basic things, but don't start getting in there and feel like I need to be a computer geek. Just learn the basic things you need to do and just learn those things and cut out all that noise. Don't let your family and friends go, oh, you can do this or that and make it complicated. If you know how to turn on the computer, do emails, make an attachment, get on LinkedIn, learn a few things, you, you can do this. You yeah, know? Very well said. We've got one more question, but while we're answering this last one, please go ahead and send in your kind thank yous to Andrew for answering all these questions. We really appreciate Andrew being here, of course. Uh, and so please go ahead and type in your thank yous as we ask this. I think we should question. thank you for the great questions. <laughs> I think they're good ones. Uh, and with that said, our, our last question here, we, we get a lot of these questions on of this particular one, which is, I don't have the knowledge to write a PPA. I understand what you said about the patent. I Now we're, we're shifting it. Okay, PPA, I get it. So two parts. One is I don't know how to write a PPA or I, do, I don't really want to deal with that legal mess. I don't know how to write, you know, all that deal. I don't know how to do that. And when should I file a PPA? So how do I file a PPA or how do I write a PPA? And how do, when, when should I be dealing with the PPA? What, what step? So for those of you who have been following us for a while, you're probably familiar with this, but for those of you that are new, this is good to hear. Um, so if you ever look up a patent on Google Patents or the Patent Office site, and you see a patent and you're like, oh my God, what the heck is that? That's some sort of foreign language. Like I could never do that. And I think that's why people freak out thinking falsely that a PPA has to be written like a full utility patent. And it doesn't. It can be written in common English. I have InventRight students that write PPAs all the time and they don't have a GED. So if they don't have a high school degree and they can do it, you can do it. So it can be done in common English. So that's very empowering. Another empowering thing I'll say about PPAs is 80% of filing a PPA is just thinking about the workarounds, variations and improvements and including them. So the problem is like when you've been thinking about and dreaming up this idea and thinking about it for a long time, after a while, most inventors, you'd be shocked to me say, saying this, lose their creativity. They're like, this is what it is. This is what it is. This is what it is. And you've been saying that to yourself like for six months, a year, two years, some people, 10 years, God, you know, and that's fine if you did your market research and this is what it is in the marketing piece. But what you want to do for the PPA is what else could it be? Knock yourself off. So, go, oh, could it be done like this or like that? Throw all that in the PPA. Now, don't get ridiculous with it. Don't include a version of it that is half as good. That's not competition. That's being obsessive. I've seen inventors do this and write 80-page PPAs. Not a good use of your time. But to do a version that's 75% as good, 90% as good, just as good, but not the version you're pitching, throw all that in your PPA. And so that is 80% of filing a PPA, and that has just required your creativity. But the fact that most inventors have been thinking about what it is, you got to get out of your head and go, okay, how would I knock myself off? What else could it be? And that's hard for inventors to do. So that's 80% of it. Now we have software called Smart IP and that's included with our coaching program that helps people file a PPA. Um, I do think for those of you that don't wanna join as an InventRight student, we do have, there are people that do videos on YouTube, like attorneys, you could watch what they're doing. Some of them, I feel like they do a poor job just to, make you feel like you can do it and then hire them later, go, I couldn't figure this out. So be careful of that. So, but I don't want to just keep referring you guys back to invent, right? Saying you got to hire us as a coach and then we're going to give you software to do it. So there are people on YouTube doing videos on how to do it. Um, most of the time, it doesn't make that much of a difference. You know, a if a company doesn't show interest in your marketing piece, you're not going to want to see your PPA. So you don't even have to show it and you never want to show it up front. So you could always have the time if you did a PPA, you're never going to show it to them up front. You're going to talk to them about right. the product. So if you needed to go back, and this is a great tip and go, you know, I don't know if I did a good job with that. You could go into an attorney, a friendly one, because um, most of them are going to go, oh, you did a terrible job. Give me $10,000, you know, go to a friendly one. You can come to me. I can send you a friendly one and fix it before you show it to the company. But you could have many calls and emails before you'd have to show your PPA to a company. Yep. It's not as important as you think. And you've got that patent pending status. They cannot see it. They don't have no idea what you protected. They don't know you scribbled on a piece of paper with a crayon or you did a fantastic job. So you have time to go back, file another PPA and then show them a good one. So most people are like, oh God, that, that's such a relief, Andrew. Like that I could do a half-assed job. Don't, 
but I could do it and I could still have time to have somebody do a better job if I get traction. It just helps people move forward. You now, know, Andrew, you, you've got everyone fired up now. So everyone's like, all right, I'm going to, I'm going to end this meeting. I'm going to write my PPA and I'm going to immediately file it right now. So my question is, when should we be filing a PPA? You, you're setting me up for that one. I know, you know what I'm going to say there. <laughs> you know, people is, learn about the PPA and they're like, oh, I'm excited. I can say patent pending. And they just file it right away. Like if you're, if you're not ready to reach out the next week to companies, cause you don't know how to, cause you haven't been watching the invent right TV show and rambling about, you know, how to reach out and all that, or you're not a student or whatever. What's the point? The year's just going to run out and you're sitting on your hands and, you know, and yeah, if you haven't made public disclosure, you can file a PPA again, but it's just a waste of $75. So no, but if it does make you feel secure, like I've got my placeholder in time, that's fine. And you can file it, but you, you should really know how to reach out to companies and be ready and stuff. If you're going to file it, if you ask me, and that's not legal advice. So talk to an attorney if you need legal advice. It's my little disclaimer. But those are some things to think on. You yeah, know? Wonderful. No, that's fantastic. Uh, thank you for answering all of these questions. Of course, please type in your thank yous in the chat and let's uh, do a, a round of applause here. I'm going to unmute everyone. You guys can do a little, little clap here. I have to press unmute. Thank you. I'm just recording you. Bravo. Okay. All right. So, uh, hey, what about we do uh, the screenshot? I can take. Yeah, let's do a family I, I photo. I can never like give a thumbs up or hold my hand because I'm the one doing the screenshot, but that's okay. Uh, so um, let's go to the first page. So are we ready? Everybody give a thumbs up or hold up your hand. Give a big smile. And it's take me a second to do a couple pages here with people that are on video. We got the second page, we got the third page, really nobody on the fourth or fifth page has their video on. So we're good there. I got it. Perfect. Okay. And then Andrew, if you want to give any final remarks on barriers, and then I'm going to bring up the uh, five inventors uh, uh, groups that we're going to be sponsoring tonight. But if you want to just start off with any like last words about barriers or excuses that we internally make as inventors, that'd be great. I, I, I think, I think through IGA and through invent, right. And through our invent, right. YouTube show, I think we scare the crap out of people, Courtney, <laughs> you know why? Because they have all these reasons why not in their head. And then we remove them. It's like, oh crap. Now I know what to do. Scary. And I don't have, I can't use it Shoot. as an excuse or I know what to do now. And, and I think that scares people. Um, but I like that. That's good. I like scaring people. I like making people feel empowered is really the more of the, what I should Proper be saying. Terms. Take around all those roadblocks, financial roadblocks, mental roadblocks. Um, and I'm going to say also, if you have people in your family or friends that aren't supportive and are telling you you're a wacky inventor or whatever, just stop talking to them about your inventions. Talk to the ones that are supportive, but don't talk to the ones that aren't. And most of them, they don't know how to do licensing. But the one, this is one thing that the layman or a clueless person will say and consider it a compliment. When you tell your friends and family it's about your idea, and, and they say, that's a great idea. You better get a patent on that. Don't get a patent, but realize <laughs> that's a great compliment. What they mean is you better protect it. I think it's a great idea, you know, but that doesn't mean you should go out and spend 10K on a patent when you can spend 75 on a provisional. So don't take their advice, but take it as a compliment. But it's a misdirected compliment, but it's, they're, they're, they're trying to be encouraging. So take it with a, um, as a compliment. Well said. This is definitely the the again the reality of the the harsh reality of getting rid of these barriers. And it's beautiful that it's just you. It's not anything else. You don't have to keep blaming something. It is you to combat these barriers. And I hope this has helped everyone realize that it is us, and we now are equipped with a little bit more knowledge to help us combat these internal mental struggles that we have, and finally start to make movement towards our uh, inventing goals and and dreams of having our products in the market. Let me bring up this uh, inventors group um, image. And then if you want to briefly, Andrew, talk about what inventors groups are. Okay. So, so we, we um, IGA, we have inventor group presidents every month we get on with them 
and we do whatever we can at IGA to support them because we realize nobody, Stephen and I have spoke to inventor groups over decades and nobody was supporting them. So that's how we started IGA. It was actually to support the inventor group leaders, not inventors. And so we, we would have meetings. What do you guys need? How can we help you run your group? How can you help each other, give each other advice? Let's all support each other because none of them were talking to each other. But after a while, we're like, why don't we start doing webinars just for inventors too and Zoom sessions for inventors? And so we don't, these aren't the only groups. Every month we kind of put up a few different groups, but on our site, there's a ton of groups. So one thing that social media can't do, if you can go to some of these groups, there's going to be probably one in your state. There might be one near you. There might not. But check out our website. You're going to be like, you're going to meet with other people. Maybe they have pizza. Maybe they have a speaker. And you're just going to be like, here's other people. They think like me. My friends and family don't get me. So it's something that you don't get the in-person meetings that you can't get on Zoom, that you can't get from even a cut. Like, it's just nice. It's a nice, there's a lot of benefits to attending a local inventor group. So I encourage you guys to do that. Um, some groups are better than others. Um, I, I'd like to see some of these groups being, um, having more young people and more women. Sometimes you show up and it's kind of older guys. I got my 20th patent and it's like, okay. <laughs> you know, and, and it's like, what many products you have in the market? I'm going to file my 21st patent. It's like, oh, okay. So there, at some of these groups, there's going to be people you should not follow their advice. But there's, gonna, there's always good people that you're going to connect with. So I really encourage you to attend the inventors groups. And, and it could really add something. And go to your local group. If you don't like it, okay, don't go back. But I think you might like it. I think you might enjoy it. And if anything, it really does build community. I mean, that's why we're here at IGA. That's what we do, what we do, and why we love it so much is because we are creating community. And that is so much more powerful when you're not alone and you aren't. We're here for you. Uh, so with that said, thank you guys so much for coming to this very last Inventors Online in December of 2021. We hope you guys have a wonderful holidays, and we hope to see you guys in January in 2022 for our next uh, event coming up. So again, we appreciate you guys coming tonight, and we hope to bring you more expert information in the areas you need help in. Thanks again, everyone, and happy holidays. Take care. Keep inventing, everybody. Bye. Bye, everyone.